2019 was actually one hell of a DGT for me. I don't know if you remember, I had the world's biggest blisters. Um, and I think anyone would be rather stupid to go and attempt that again after that. But there was something calling me from, from the Drakensberg. And uh, I started doing some research just to see if anyone had done the double. And I saw it was attempted, but uh, not conquered. So that's what I focused on. Yeah, I wanted to come back for a double. We were out in Cedarburg doing a Cedarburg Traverse, which is 100 kilometers across the Cedarburg Mountains. And about 3 a.m. in the morning, out of quietness of hiking, no one has said a word for a couple of hours. Rodney comes in the writing question, Alan, would you like to do a double DGT? And then Rodney went on to say that um, he actually wants me to put a team together and help him to put a team together. I was an extended invite through Alan and he just one day messaged me saying 250 kilometers, 20,000 meters of it, 12 days. To which I replied, is it Cedarburg? And he said, no, it's Drakensberg. Um, it's something that I've always um, dreamt of sort of getting up on that, that, that range. I mean, when you're sort of driving from Johannesburg down to the Midlands and you look at that escarpment, it's such an obvious challenge, such an obvious thing that you have to go and do. So I said yes before he sort of finished his sentence. Is it start day today? To the big mountains. Andrew, how are you feeling? I'm very nervous. I feel very undercooked with this expedition. That's for sure. <laughs> you definitely need the lights for the bag. So <laughs> exactly. You got the, I need, you got, I need you got, some. Uh, you got the upper hand there, brothers. We the heavy waiters of the trip. We are indeed. We're going to be carrying. Uh, but yeah, after day one, we'll start getting lighter. That's the good news. Super excited. Um, glorious day. Yes. It is day one and we will keep everyone updated as the days continue. That's day one of the DGT double. Rodney's given me a navigation responsibility for today. Um, we're already one kilometer into the hike. Everyone's happy, full of smiles taking everything at the moment and yeah looking forward to getting to the first cave for tonight it'll be about 20 k's to the cave and we'll set up camp and sort of settle in for the night and get used to everything and then start tomorrow morning that's an early and a big day tomorrow 
you know, when, when we talk about the drugs migraine traverse is that it's self-navigated. So in 2019, obviously we had Mike Owen as our guide. So we didn't really go into the detail. We, we thought Mike, he knows the route. Because Rodney has already done the route and it's quite a set route, I did not have to do much prep myself. You might be lucky you get a, I mean, a cattle route for maybe 100, you know, 150, 300 meters which is nice, you gain a bit of momentum, but then it's broken again because you're off trail again. The navigation was fine, never get too overconfident about nav navigation, but it's pretty okay. Like at nighttime, you have to focus a little bit more. And also when you're on cattle parts, no, don't just blindly follow it. But in daytime and when you had good visibility, it was pretty easy to see, okay, I'm aiming for that saddle or that valley. For those of you that haven't been a, a lot of time on the escarpments, uh, effectively, there aren't footpaths a lot of the time. You might find the sort of goat track, uh, the sheep track, um, but a lot of the time you're, you're, you're cutting cross country and there's a lot of uh, very small bushy vegetation. It sort of varies between, I guess, being this high to sort of hip high and you're constantly sort of, um, your foot's constantly rolling in and out and off this vegetation. How's it, Andrew? Yeah. It's a tough. tough climb. Indeed. Broken ground. It's day one. Um, <clears throat> we are 17 k's in. We're about to get to our last big climb and then we'll settle for the night and we would have completed about 21 k's for the day so yeah almost day one done can you believe it going up there we've got to go up there all the way up there Whew. it's a little hard just a little bit Waiting for Andrew, Rodney, and Corey to catch up. They're just behind me, not too far. Yeah, two lows. The whole time we had the same one. The whole time? Okay, no, no, no. Just from the drop here. We've arrived at our PO box for tonight, our little home. A little cozy. Welcome, Rod. Thank you. Uh, Alex. <laughs> Man sleeping already, taking in the rest. Day two. Morning, Kari. Morning Andrew. Morning Alan, how are you doing? Right, morning. Morning Al. How's it buddy, you right? Yeah, good, good. It's a bit breezy this morning. I can literally take out the entire thing. <gasps> Holy smokes. <laughs> <laughs> Would you look at that? It's like freaking minus two, yeah? It's just what it feels like. Rodney doing his makeup. Hey, pretty Rodney. What do you mean? <laughs> hey, pretty Rodney. Andrew enjoying his brekkie. Overnight oats. That's it. And tell us what happened to those oats during yeah, the night. Can I, ask you a favor? I think we had a little mouse nibbling at them. <laughs> Sharing your. Um, waking up in the morning, um, cold, wet, um, slightly hungry. Putting on your wet clothes from the day before. It's you know it's it's before dawn. It's it's still pretty chilly. And sort of knowing that you've got like 32 k's ahead of you, which is you know something like eight, 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 nine, ten hours of sort of continual walking with with no breaks, that each morning can be a little bit of a, a test of faith or a test of fortitude. Good morning, it's day two. Um, I picked up two blisters yesterday, but I managed to sort them out this morning before leaving. 
So today we have to, we've got to cover about just over 30 k's to the next point. Um, everyone is feeling well, happy, um, solid good spirits. So today's elevation won't be as much as yesterday. Yesterday's elevation was quite savage, but um, we pushed through, but they settled in for the night. And yeah, looking forward to this day. Yeah, fortunately from day one, I developed blisters and I teamed up with Karu. Karu, every morning would wake up, strap my feet for me, get me ready for the day. I would start like an old little cripple man and I'll get going. And like, I never once let the team down. I was always in front ahead, even with the blisters. And as the days went on, it got worse and worse and worse. And then also day one, I was bitten by a spider on my knee. So I had this big, like, pastoring thing. Morning, Rodney. Morning, Al. It's day two. Day two. What is expected of us today? We've got five climbs today. Yeah, we're hoping to camp near Sani Pass. Uh, if you're feeling good, maybe you just passed it. Well, let's hope we have a good day. Day two, just come from Zamudi Cave, that's there in the distance. Done our first climb. And we're gonna go down Wilson's Wall and follow that ravine all the way. Today. I've got some rub for your shoulders later. What is life, eh, Rods? Very marshy here, yeah. a lot of water. I'm trying not to get the feet wet and using these little humps to navigate over this marshland. Pretty freaky, but definitely cool. Day two is over. We've reached our destination for the night. Yeah. We're setting up a tent. Rodney's tent. How many of you have? Our tent. Kara's new tent. The palace is near Dainty. Oh, wow. Luxury at its finest. Rods, are you happy we're settling down for today? Yes, we are. Otherwise, and we wouldn't have made it. Yeah, it's quite late in the day yep. and also a big day. Morning, Karu. It's day three. We're having some coffee. At 10. It was raining a bit last night. It's Drogginsburg Marathon Day today. And Drogginsburg Marathon Day today. A big day. to summiting our first uh, peak of the Grand Traverse. And the highest. Yes, exactly. Yes. Day three, um, we've got about another two k's to get to the highest point of the Drogsberg Traverse. Um, we're just taking a quick sit there, a quick breather. We're about three and a half thousand meters above sea level. 
we're traumatizing quite nicely. The gloves aren't too strenuous. We're still breathing easily. So that's a good sign. Don't have a Nice all lines. Extreme weather conditions was something that was always going to be a factor for us because it's so unpredictable for anyone. But we kept in communications, Rodney kept in communications with the crew, giving us weather forecasts because a snowstorm was a real reality that we had to take in consideration. Um, we had we never had rain. We had rain during the day once as well as hail, but besides that, it was mostly at night time. But it was still some of the coldest conditions that I have experienced. And the wind chills was very much up there. Um, there were stages where you left no skin exposed just to protect yourself. And yeah, like it didn't snow, but I am curious to how it would have changed our experience if it did snow. I think the other general um, challenge that you can have is just basically you're tramping along these valleys and you get to one valley, you go down the next valley, you go down the next valley, it becomes pretty repetitive. And there are moments when you're just walking, you're just like, why did I agree to this? Like what part of me thought this was a great idea? And you know, you, you were very brave in your training and excited about it. And now you are kind of miserable at times. Hail in the darkness. <laughs> It's the end of day three. Right. Rodney and Andrew are setting up the tent. The car is getting ready. I'm gonna help her now. She's gonna set up the palace for us. Sure. Long day on the feet. List is not looking so good. Day four and we're off. Rodney's already gone. Is it out? How's it, Andrew? You having a good morning? Oh yeah, it's not been too bad. Cold? Cold, yes. A few showers in the evening. A little bit. You and I are the blister guys. Yeah, only got, mine's... Um, You've been having a bit of a bad time with my, blisters. My blisters are a grade two, and I think uh, Alan's a grade 14. They're <laughs> off the charts. Well, we'll see what we can do about them. These blisters aren't going to keep me exactly. from We're walking. Suck it up and move on. That's it. On our way to Giant's Castle. Just done the first climb. Valley. There's Andrew. <clears throat> Beautiful. Incredible. So we've made it to the saddle. We're gonna drop our bags. And we're gonna summit Chinese Castle, is it right? That's it. Yes, looking forward to it. Up there. To climb up to Giant's Castle. How's it, Andrew? It's tough today. Yes, indeed. Can't wait to summit the Giant's Castle. Just look at this. <laughs> yeah. Just a little bit. Yeah. About to summit Giant's Castle. You excited, Kaoru? Fuck! <laughs> A lot of ice everywhere. Go summit, Kaoru.
saying is this place. Anyone want to shower? <laughs> the end of day four, having a robust tea here. I'm extremely tired. My blisters have gotten the better of me. Let's have a look. Okay, let's cover it up. Oh, there's one. But we stay strong, and stay positive, and you know, three days left. Crazy. Morning Rodney. Morning, morning. How are you doing? That's great. Cold, good. cold day in the Berg. It was freezing this morning. Woke up with the tents all frozen up. All eh? frozen. And um, how are you feeling for today? Feeling good. We were traversing back down to uh, Tabana and through into the next valley and for maybe 30 minutes or so it was freezing and we, you know, you could hardly get your gloves on, you're covered in sleet and snow and I was just like, is this really going to continue like this? But it stopped and um, I guess that's the joy in thinking we're actually pretty lucky. We had that, you know, one or two poor weather moments, but actually we were, we were blessed with the weather. So actually, in retrospect, those lows actually highlight how lucky we were to, to get away with what we... I mean, I mean, ultimately, you don't sort of conquer all the traverse. The, the traverse allows you to pass through. Very close to the highest peak in South Africa. Not that spectacular. Um, you know, it's just a pile of rocks. But yeah, yeah, we are 3,000, 3,300 meters above sea level. Check out this pile of rocks. Crazy. Clouds coming over. They're going to disappear into the clouds now. Get it off to Champagne. The Champagne Castle Peak that we actually tagged in 2019 was actually the incorrect one, slightly lower. There are three of them, funny enough, and it's the middle one that counts. When we did Champagne, uh, one of the people on the group that was following pointed out to us that it was the incorrect peak. I actually sent Mike a message from the mountain <laughs> to triple check, and he came back saying, my bad, uh, yes, so, Karu and I decided on the way back that we're going to do a double summit just to close that and uh, put it to bed. It's day six, day six. We're a little bit behind schedule. So Ronnie, your current day seven was to do 36 days, is that right? There was a moment where we started falling back on our daily mileage and I knew the only way we could get ahead of the curve or, or maintain our goal of seven days for the first DGT was uh, that we had to put in a night section and uh, that was huge. Uh, the, the group wasn't uh, entertaining much of that and uh, I gave them some time to just, just dwell on it, uh, more from a, um, how can I say, giving them the, the idea of having choices, but at the end of the day I knew <laughs> that it wasn't a choice, <laughs> we're going to press ahead. And basically we did a, a, a full on stint right through the night, through the next day, and the guys pulled it off. We are literally navigating by moonlight. I put my torch off for a while, and you can actually see clearly where we're going. Yeah. 
It's day seven. <laughs> and soup. It's day seven. On our way to Sentinel. We're about 20 k's out. We should get there just after lunch. Excited. Are you excited? Halfway today. Junk food today. Junk food day. Real food day. How do you feel about eating junk food, Rodney? <laughs> Rodney's a coke addict. Rodney, you're a coke addict. Just missed it. Buddy, look at this view. Andrew, what do you think? Whoa. Yeah, it's never it's never an easy thing to to leave half your team behind. But what worked out nicely is both Andrew and Alan in the individual moments on that last day uh, approached me. I could see during the journey that it was gonna be a, a big ask for them to turn around considering the the magnitude of the blisters they had and Alan also having some, uh, he had a spider bite on the side of his knee uh, that also contributed. So they approached me um, and that kind of smoothed things over and uh, yeah, I just knew they weren't going to be turning around and uh, I, was, I was okay with that, but definitely one of the down moments. And I could see, you know, physically apart from the blisters, they were totally capable. So also for them, it was a huge uh, decision and not an easy one. It's a very bittersweet situation for me because um, I went out there for one reason only, and it was to compete the, the double. I didn't go there to compete a single. So mentally, I was ready for that. And when I got to the Sentinel, uh, which was our turning point, um, and I took the plus on my feet, I had blissed, oh, I had, my feet were raw about that thick on my heels. So, I looked at Roddy, Roddy looked at me, and I just, I, I couldn't anymore. Mentally, I was still there, um, but who knows what kind of damage I would have done to my feet. So yeah, I took the next flight out back to Cape Town to get back to the hospital and sort of my feet and uh, subsequently the, the spider bite. So yeah, very bittersweet, but I've been hard on myself, but I'm trying not to be hard on myself because I still compete at DGT. Yeah, it, I think it was a decision that was brewing sort of sort of day five, day six, day seven. Um, I basically made an error of judgment in my footwear. And then unfortunately, the outsides of my toes became really, really sore. And I think when I lost sort of one layer of skin, it was fine. Second layer, by the third layer, um, although it's only a couple of centimeters in size, the, the pain starts to become quite um, prohibitive. And um, I was watching Caro and I was watching Rodney, um, you know, jaunting ahead of me a little bit, and I knew that I was starting to slow them down. But I think the challenge is when you turn around, it's not like you say, okay, guys, we'll give it a go for a couple of days, we'll see how we get on. And maybe, you know, maybe it works out, maybe it doesn't work out. When you turn and you're at the Montessor and you're at the, ladder, uh, at the ladders there, you're in for seven days and you can't let the guys down. And if there became a problem where I couldn't continue, it would have affected everybody else's opportunities. So you have to be selfless there. So it was really hard to leave Andrew and Alan behind and continue without them. We definitely kept them in our minds all the way. As we like past places, we shared with them just a week before. And it's important to notice their presence in the first traverse, mentally for the team, but also physically, there's more gear to share in an emergency. And it was really special to reunite them afterwards as well because only, there's only a few people in our everyday life that can really identify with what we experienced. I think adventures sometimes get to a point where it's really difficult for people to really identify with it. And they were the closest to that experience with us. 
So that was a relationship that will always remain special. For a very long time, I felt like I didn't accomplish anything. And that's basically because I'm very hard on myself. Um, I'm from a military background and I've been, you know, working in the Navy for the last 15 years. So I've been very hard on myself. It took me a long time to actually come to the realization what I actually completed amongst the biggest scheme of things. So yeah, I'm very grateful and I've done a lot of self-reflection and I'm grateful that I've actually managed to have the opportunity to actually do this. So it took me a while to, to make peace with what happened, but I'm very, like I said, very grateful that I actually had this opportunity and that I do have a DGT behind my back, which very few people will ever get to experience. So I take a high five out of that. The, the, the only other, other challenge with sort of making that decision was a bit of game theory. I knew Alan was really struggling. And I was kind of thinking, you know, if I pull out, will there only be um, the three of us? Um, uh, or be the, th the three of them? And, you know, would they then be sort of carrying extra incremental weight because they've got one tent between three people, or two tents between three people? And, and not, so I thought that, that could have been unfair as well. So I was also looking at Alan to see if he was going to pull out, what was going to happen, whether it was going to be two or three people that did the return. So I'm really sad for Alan that it pulled out as well. But I think um, it being a couple on the way back was, was also quite a strong sort of result. So I really want to say that we never thought that we weren't going to be able to complete the second leg. But towards the end of the first traverse, the last few kilometers, the decision was getting closer and closer because we knew Alan and Andrew were struggling. And Rodney also had maybe bronchitis. So we were faced with two options. It was either going to be turn around tomorrow and do it all over again or it was going to stop and the dream dies. Both very weighted options. But um, yeah, so there was that, but there was also, we had to be realistic about bad weather, a bad injury. Anything could stop us and force us off the mountain, even though we are capable to finish it. But luckily we had a good weather window. We had to just keep moving, keep eating, keep the spirits up and take care of our feet. Well, when I flew back to Cape Town, I stayed glued to my phone, um, waiting for updates all the time. Candy was the, was the one behind all the updates. And I, I couldn't wait to see all the updates all there. And I knew if two people could do it, it'd be Rodney and Karu. And I think the, the joy of this was um, that you find some like-minded people that you can actually spend that time up on the mountain together. You know, it's not something I could have done on my own. I wouldn't have tempted on my own, at least not to that point in time. Um, so, I'm just grateful that I had the opportunity to do that with, with, with such like-minded people. And it's something that I'm going to cherish. I'll always look back on it. Um, you know, you, you look back on the last decade, there are one or two things or events that you remember, and, and this will definitely be, you know, up there, up there. Hey, Carter, what do you got there? Crinkly glass eyes. And where'd you find that? This here. In the river. Yeah. Yo. 
Ja. Hur går det så nu i Ja. Så en tur på Mafadi. Kalu trying to break the ice here. Beautiful day, but freezing. And as John Fora would say, ladies and gentlemen, we are approaching the highest peak in South Africa, Mafari. What a glorious day, but the temperatures are icy, icy cold. See the mattress of clouds on our left. This is Mufadi tagged for the second time on our way back. Well done, Karu! In Sika! Beautiful. We're walking the ridge line towards Giant's Castle. We have the most incredible day. And there she is at the end. Karu in the distance. The views are sublime. Yeah, massive achievement for her, but also being, you know, like part of a team to get her over the line was uh, hugely satisfy satisfying. I mean, she put in a lot of hard work during that DGT, and the second leg she came back so strong. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm actually more chuffed for Karu than my own achievement. Um, I think the accolades are, are uncontested, and uh, yeah, she can be very proud of herself. So the highest point was definitely Giant's Castle Summit on the second traverse. It's Rodney's favorite view on the traverse. And so it was really special to, to share that with him, especially since we didn't get to see it on the first way. It was just overcast and yeah, no views. And if you look on the map, the route makes quite a significant turn there. And so it felt like home stretch for us. We had one significant peak left to tag, although 100 kilometers but we felt like we almost have it in the bag. Uh, summiting Giant's Castle and watching Kara go up and uh, yeah, <laughs> I still recorded it. Um, <clears throat> quite emotional, um, but yeah, for her being the first woman, that was insane. And like I knew it was in the bag. Although we had two days still to go, yeah, we had it. There goes Kauru Yodan, 32 years old, first lady to do the DGT Drakensberg Grand Traverse double in 14 days. Absolute lantern. History in the making.
Giant's Castle. Absolute perla of a day. Here we have Karu. Gonna be the first lady to do a double DGT. And she's gonna make history. Love it. Um, Kara is a very strong-minded woman. Um, I didn't think twice of actually picking her for the team, for, for being part of the team, because I knew that she would do it. And Rodney, obviously, subsequently having done it before, um, it was a no-brainer. They were going to do it, um, and I just I was really excited to just see them get through it. And it just gave me goosebumps when they crossed the line, and uh, made me so happy. I just so happy for them. So again, sad that I mean I wasn't there you know, to finish them, finish with them. But they did it, they did it for us, all of us. Yeah, I mean, absolutely delighted for them to, for what they've achieved there. Um, I mean, coming down to the, to Sentinel Car Park, I guess touching the post and turning around, I think that moment of setting foot again, back that way, knowing that you're committed for another seven days, after already being sort of, uh, you know, being depleted in energy, et cetera, is, is a hell of a feat, but, um, the, the traverse was hard, it was tough. I mean, obviously my, my feet didn't quite make it. Um, for them to then have completed that in 14 days is special. And I guess it's testament to the fact that nobody had done it before, you know, and supported. So they should be really, really proud of what they've achieved. Um, yeah, I'm in awe of, of what they've achieved actually. I really wish I could have been there to share it with them. But uh, yeah, you know, well done to them. They, they really deserve a lot of praise. I mean, Rodney entrusted me in putting a team together for this. And when I proposed a question to Karu, she kind of gave the same answer I did when Rodney, answered, when Rodney asked me, and she took it with both hands. She said, yes, definitely. When? When are we going? When is this happening? And then already I knew that Kokoro will easily cruise through this because she's a woman who's done many hundred kilometer trail races, and I've seen her potential. And besides her fitness, um, mentally she's got the right head on her to get through this thing because Everyone is going to get tired. Fitness is going to carry you to a certain level. But what pulls you through these big moments is your mental capability. And that's what Kari had. I mean, I, I would say she was probably one of the mentally strongest out of all of us. Um, because, I mean, she had to put up with three guys all the time that are naturally are stronger than her. And she never once fell behind. She never once slacked off. She was always up there in front. And, yeah, you know, it's just incredible to have shared this with her out of, out of all people I find, yeah, very special. Yeah, she, she really is an inspiration. I mean, um, you know, you, I don't know, we're like a monster or something like that. I mean, she's so fit and so strong. And, and it, it, it wasn't easy for her. I know in the first um, sort of two or three days, she, she was actually lagging at times. And, you know, we, we're, we're a team. You don't really sort of raise those points because you, you know that somebody's suffering and you want to support them. But it's like an unspoken kind of rule that you don't actually want to kind of quiz them about how they're really feeling. But you can see that she's having a tough time. And, I mean, it's, it's an obvious fact, but people should really think about it. Her, the, the weight of her, 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 her body to the weight of the rucksack, that proportion is hugely disproportionate to what the boys were carrying. So she's actually, um, you know, incrementally done a lot more than, than, than the guys here. So um, that mustn't be underestimated. I think it's really, really impressive what she did. And she got stronger and stronger. So um, and she's, a, she's mentally tough as well. You need to be mentally tough, physically tough. But um, no, hats off, she, she ticks all the boxes there. And, and, Pleasant with it, you know. I think she great, great character to be on the mountain with, uh, and a real joy to have spent at least seven days with her. And I think you, you're sort of looking at it from afar. Uh, we did have the the WhatsApp group, and we also had the ability to track uh, track on Garmin. So you were tracking people's progress day on day when you were sort of sat at your desk or where you were when they were doing the second leg, and uh, you you know what it's like to be there. You were just at those peaks only a few days before, so. It, you felt like you were with them, and, and there was a lot of disappointment, actually, that you couldn't sort of walk those final steps with them. I think it was more euphoria uh, and accomplishment. Um, definitely not the hardest. We were actually feeling super strong. I think if there was anything that was not so good was we were a bit tired, because again, we put it through a, another night section. Uh, we decided we wanted to finish just over 13 days rather than <laughs> just, just 14 days. Um, yeah, and the night section went well. It was a tough section. The 18K descent to Marty Pass, uh, quite treacherous. You gotta be on your A game. We had a lot of wind. Uh, it was difficult to navigate. 
But uh, seeing that sun rise and we were on the last seven k's, that was just magic. It was very surreal coming back into society and now having to accept what you've done. To me personally, when we finished weeks after, maybe months, maybe still, I feel like it wasn't that big of an achievement, which is maybe because it was a humbling experience, partly, but also I think it indicates that we have capacity for so much more and that leaves you a bit speechless and to what is possible and it leaves you a bit scared and curious and it was a, quite a hard thing to communicate to those around you but I'm really proud of myself and I'm really privileged to have had the opportunity to be the first female. Rodney loves pointing out that I was the first female but he was very much the first male to also do it. We accompanied each other and a DG double was never going to be a solo endeavor. Yeah. DDT double finishes. <laughs> Love it. Well done, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yo, yo. Open up. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <-hoo. laughs> <laughs> Legends. Yeah, well done. Yeah. <laughs> Pet man. Yeah. Here it is. Here it is. <laughs> And stop there for a photo. <laughs> Get to the gate. Huh? Getting to the gate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I just want to give credit to the team. I mean, they put in a lot of effort before, there was a lot of planning involved. Uh, they stuck to their guns. Um, Andrew Allen pulling out, it was by no means a, a light decision, um, but it would never have been possible without the team. Uh, they had a big role to play in the first leg and uh, it was even more motivation to finish. Firstly, I'd like to congratulate um, Colin Rodney on completing the DGT. Sadly, I wasn't able to be there, but this would not have been possible if it wasn't for you know, the, the support team, the people that's in the background and everything else. So firstly, I would like to say thank you to Candy because she ran a lot of, a lot of the, the WhatsApp and, the, and everything else behind the scenes, updating everyone, everyone the news as, as the days went on. And there was also a very nice support team, um, Earvolt and his friends that came out to the Sentinel to meet us halfway. You know, they unselfishly took time out of their day and their lives for us and to support us. And yeah, I really, really do appreciate that. And it, it doesn't go unnoticed. And to all our friends and family back home, thank you for following us. It's very special. We had a massive WhatsApp group that actually was set up and it reached the limits of all the people that was following us. And yeah, it was just incredible the support we received from this. And again, Congratulations to Corey and Rodney for completing this amazing feat. And I'm very fortunate and, and blessed to call you my friends as well.
there's still something in the Drakensberg pulling me. Don't know what it is. Um, maybe watch the space. We don't know. Um, yeah, just putting it out there. <laughs>